proportion of the 1.4 million voters who ride motorcycles are supportive of the, the current proposals. Uh, but I don't know. Politician who says he doesn't know. Uh, yes. Government plans to end the sale of new internal combustion engine motorcycles seem to be getting ever closer. The suggestion is that the announcement on the consultation results is imminent. MAG is representing the views of the vast majority of motorcyclists who are opposed to this proposal. We've been telling politicians that the majority of riders do not want this. But have they been listening? I was invited to attend the MCIA's annual conference. We were treated to a lineup of politicians who were going to talk about the motorcycle industry and what they're doing about it. And needless to say, the internal combustion engine question was going to be a leading part of the conversation. So what did they all have to say? First up it was the current minister Anthony Brown, who unfortunately couldn't attend, so we had to watch a video presentation. And while the motorcycle market is unarguably unique, it's clear our climate ambitions must be reflected pragmatically and proportionately across all sectors to make our transport system fit for the future. My department is currently analysing the responses to our consultation on L category N sales days. And I'd like to thank you for your patience during this process. We're committed to hearing your priorities and concerns, because with your continued support, we can agree a roadmap that works for industry and consumers. And my government will continue to support you where we can. Okay, so uh, I don't think any massive surprises there. Uh, from the so yes, as Tony Campbell said, no massive surprises there from the Minister. Thank you for your patience and we'll support you if we can. So what did Ian Stewart have to say? I stand with the MCIA and wider industry's calls for a more pragmatic, realistic and proportionate approach to phase out. Your sector is responsible for less than half of 1% of the UK's total domestic transport emissions. And life cycle analysis has shown that some L category vehicles often produce lower life cycle emissions than fully electric cars and vans. I join colleagues in urging the government to engage with industry, not only in announcing pragmatic phase out dates within this parliament, but also in the full and proper implementation of the action plan so industry can meet these targets without causing undue harm to a sector we all know has such a crucial role to play in the future of transport. As chair of the Transport Select Committee, our work in holding the government to account is crucial. We are committed to ensuring that policies and regulations align with the best interests of the industry and the public. So there we go, another Tory MP who couldn't quite bring himself to leave his Westminster bubble to attend the meeting, giving us a video presentation. To be fair, there was a little bit more hope from that speech. He did realise that motorcycles only produced naught or less than 0.5% of CO2 emissions from the transport sector. He did accept the need for a pragmatic and proportional approach. He said he was prepared to work with the industry. But again, there's no real mention of what the riders want, was there? So then we moved on to Fabian Hamilton, the Labour MP who didn't waste his opportunity to point out the fact that he was in the room when the others weren't. I'm here in person, you don't have to watch another video. Can't knock him for that, he is an MP after all. Now, I've been a Member of Parliament uh, for nearly 27 years, I'm Labour and I represent Leeds North East. Uh, I only gained my full motorcycle licence when I successfully passed my Mod 2, finally, in November 2013. I was 58 years old. Yeah, I, I don't look it, I know. Um, since then, I've taken up riding with great and huge enthusiasm and currently own a Honda CB1000R, a Zero SRF. Yeah, Hondas are great. Um, uh, so is the Zero, by the way. Uh, and uh, Triumph Street Triple. So a good mix of bikes there. Two of them are in London, and the Honda sits outside my home in Leeds, where I love riding into the Dales. Now, we all know the role that this sector can and must play in the future of our transport system. And as I've said before, as what will almost certainly be an election year, evidence-based argument will be more important than ever before. Research like the life cycle analysis study, which revealed that in almost every case, L-category vehicles led to substantial greenhouse gas emission savings, 
compared to other vehicle types, will prove persuasive and indeed pretty. Now, there's no doubt that mopeds, scooters, motorcycles, and other L-category vehicles provide clean, more affordable, and efficient transport solutions, contributing to reduce congestion, improved air quality, and a sustainable urban environment. We also know that L-category vehicles are currently responsible for just 0.4% of domestic transport emissions, and that motorcycle use can more than halve CO2 from private transport. The future of transport isn't just about exchanging congestion-inducing petrol and diesel cars for congestion-inducing electric vehicles. It is about more to we. As a motorcycle enthusiast myself, I've already, as I've already said, using both petrol and electric motorcycles, I'd also like to mention the benefits of leisure motorcycling, all of which apply to both combustion engine and electric bikes. There's no doubt that riding a motorcycle enhances cognitive function, reduces stress, and makes a positive contribution to mental well-being. I've definitely experienced those benefits myself. And motorcycling, especially for leisure, can also offer numerous physical health benefits too. Now, I've also found, as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, that the sense of community amongst motorcyclists fosters social connections and can counter social isolation and support positive mental health. Motorcycling has been a lifeline for many, whether through exposure to fresh air, being at one with nature, or relieving stress. Long may it continue, and I for one don't intend to give it up any time soon. Now as you can see, Fabian Hamilton is actually a motorcyclist, so probably not surprising that he's got a pretty good handle on just what a good thing motorcycling is. All the benefits it can bring to transport, to you personally, for your health and well-being, Pretty good speech, really. Did stop short, though, or didn't it, of saying what actually riders want from this policy or whether or not they accept this policy. So after Mr Hamilton, we got a rather lengthy explanation from um, Alfie Briley of the MCIA about the campaigning priorities for the MCIA over the coming 12 months. It was a rather long presentation from Alfie, and to be fair, Sarah Jones seemed to notice. Good morning. I sense you all want a cup of coffee and a break. You've probably been going for quite a long time. But what was the official line for Labour's position on transport decarbonisation and particularly for motorcycles? But I wanted to be here in person just to make sure it's really clear that our commitment is to work with you and it's important that we're here and that I'm here and listening and engaging as much as I From can. From mopeds to motorcycles, the L-Cattery industry represents a rich tradition of British manufacturing and iconic British brands. It secures tens of thousands of highly skilled jobs, as you well know, for people across the country. And it will continue to play a vital role in shaping UK transportation into the future. So what can you expect if we are lucky enough <coughs> to form the next government? And we'll rebuild our ability to make, do and sell things in Britain once more and PLVs right among Now, in October last year, we set out our plan for the automotive sector, which must, much of the L category sector can stand to benefit from, uh, on supply chains, on critical minerals, on increasing consumer confidence, on the charging infrastructure. Our strategy addresses issues at every stage of production, from securing resilient supply chains to removing those barriers. I know that the deadline for phasing out non-zero emission PLVs is a challenge that your industry is concerned about. And I was surprised to learn that the government hasn't yet responded to the consultation on the proposed phase-out date well over a year after it promised to. Businesses can't operate without clarity, and I've written to the Minister uh, for Transport to demand, or well, to ask, that government publish its response and set out the next steps for industry. So there we go, another fairly vague speech from Sarah Jones. Mentioned that they want to work with the industry, great, but what about the riders? Mentioned that they recognise that it's a concern for decarbonisation for the motorcycle industry, but no real effort to say what their position is. More a case of, well, the government needs to make up his mind. Yes, the government does need to make up his mind, but what do you want? As Labour MPs, what is your position? I think we all know what it is but it certainly wasn't spelled out. Now we have to bear in mind that all these parliamentarians were talking at the Industry Associations conference 
and therefore they were directing their marks mainly at the industry. But I thought it was important for them to just get a bit of a reminder what it is that the riders think. So from the speeches we moved on to a Q&A session with a panel. Now obviously the first thing to say is this panel was not exactly balanced. There were two Labour MPs in the room and there were no Conservatives there at all. And as far as I'm aware there was not a single MP from another party invited. So our panel consisted of the balanced views of Labour or Labour. Now, not being a shrinking violet and sitting in my customary position in the front row, I decided to ask the first question at the Q&A session. Let's see how that went. To ask whether or not uh, the panels are aware of what proportion of the 1.4 million voters who ride motorcycles uh, actually have, uh, are supportive of the, uh, the current proposals to phase out the sale of non-internal combustion engine vehicles. Um, if, we could, if we could have, a, have a, an idea as to what, what you think the proportion of people that are supportive of that policy are. Um, yeah, I'll start off. I, I have no idea, Colin, although I am a member of, of MAG and have been for many, many years. Uh, I know you campaign uh, very strongly on behalf of traditional motorcyclists and I've read the magazine, obviously, regularly, uh, but I don't know. Politician who says he doesn't know. I suspect you can tell us. Uh, yes, 90% uh, are opposed. Yeah. Is that 90% of your members or 90% of all the 1.4 million? 90% was a survey carried out uh, by uh, MAG of all motorcyclists, uh, whether they're members or non members, uh, and there was a similar survey carried out by uh, the European FEMA uh, who came back with uh, very similar results to our own. So I think it's, it's an accurate and uh, reliable figure. OK, well, thank you very much, Colin. Uh, any other follow-up questions for that particular question? I can keep you going for the full 10 minutes. Uh, well, any, any other questions we have uh, in the audience? So there you go. Two Labour MPs, one a Shadow Minister, both of them aware that this is an election year, but neither of them showing any idea as to what the majority of riders think about this policy. Now it's interesting that the figure that I quoted of 90% was questioned as to whether that was just of MAG members. Of course this isn't just MAG members. MAG members are representative of the motorcycling community and we surveyed all riders. And if you want to know the specific figures, I can give them to you. We'll leave links in the description below to the actual figures if you want to go and look them up. Our survey got over 4,800 responses. Of those responses, more than two-thirds were for non-MAG members. So it's not exactly only a survey covering MAG members only. On the question of whether motorcyclists wanted us to campaign to delay, accept or totally reject the policy, 36% said that they wanted us to campaign to delay it. 55% said they wanted us to reject it in its entirety. And I think it's interesting to note that out of MAG members, 48% said that they wanted us to reject it entirely. Out of non-members, 59% wanted us to reject it entirely. So it's not a MAG-only issue. It is not a MAG-only position. This is all riders. And it's not just UK motorcyclists. When FEMO did a similar survey to ours, which included UK riders as well, they found that the opposition to ending the sale of internal combustion engine motorcycles ran to 93%. So 90% as a round number somewhere in the middle is perfectly reliable, it's reflective of all motorcyclists. But politicians don't appear to know that, that 1.4 million voters are opposed to this policy. Now as you can see, I don't think the host was too keen on giving me the floor to take up the full 10 minutes of the Q&A session. But not to worry, he did get his chance to ask a couple of questions at the end. This is what he asked. The Labour Party has, I think, over the last year or so, um, arguably been perhaps more uh, aggressive, shall we say, in terms of its environmental push. Assuming whatever this current government uh, gives us in terms of the date by which we have to phase out, do you think there's a risk 
in any way that an incoming Labour government would, would tamper with that date and actually maybe even bring it forward. Go on, Alfie, knock it to them. Well, but at the same time, what do you think uh, an incoming Labour government would be also open-minded to potentially pushing it back and also being open-minded more broadly um, to you know, alternative fuels uh, as opposed to just looking at zero emissions at the tailpipe exclusively? I wonder why the only thing that I could think at the time was a poem by Robert Burns. We sleek at cur and timorous beastie. Oh, what a panic's in thy breastie. Thou need to start to worry. Um, well, we're, we're to take your last point first, open to that um, breadth, and, and there's, there's language in our automotive strategy that, that sets that out, not a kind of one-size-fits-all. Um, uh, on the change in date from the automotive sector, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of people who have... Um, who were very disappointed that the government pushed the, pushed the date back because they were planning for 2030. And the issue is, if you're going to set a date, you need to stick to it so that business can make the changes that they need. It's no good telling the public, oh no, we didn't mean it about wanting you to buy EV vehicles, but actually, as we know, um, with automotive, you know, they're, they're going to have to still um, make 80% of them by 2030. So it, it's counterproductive and it's, it's, it's um, destabling. So I think the commitment from Labour is that we want to bring stability so that you know what to expect. So what we've said is we need the government to respond Respond to the consultation as they promised and to set out what they want and then we want to work with you to make sure these things. So what did you think of the answers? Do you think politicians have been listening to you? Maybe we should be running a campaign to donate hearing aids to all politicians. So what are we going to do about it? The game isn't over yet. As you can see, there's a small glimmer of hope that some sensible solution will come out of all this, but we need to make our views heard. So what do you think? Please do let us know in the comments below, but more importantly, take the time to write to your Member of Parliament. Make sure that he is listening to your views. We know that over 90% of you do not want this policy. You need to let the politicians know in a way that they cannot deny. It's time to remember that we live in a democracy and our politicians are voted in by us they are there to work for us and to represent our views. Make sure they hear what you think about this policy.